fun to talk about uh, the kernel trick. So recall from the last lecture, what we have studied so far is the dual formulation of the uh, support vector machine. And then the dual formulation is a very complicated thing. Okay, so you start with the primal formulation and then you look at the Lagrangian function and then you take the gradient with respect to your primal variable, dual variable, and then do all these simplifications. And then at the end of the day, you will end up having this uh, uh, dual SVM formulation. This dual SVM formulation will take the form of this, where you have, uh, you have all these dual variables, lambda i and lambda j, y i and y j. And in addition, you have this inner product of x i and x j, uh, and so on. Okay, so the y i, y j, x i, and x j is they are the uh, they're the fixed quantities. They're not the optimization variables. The only variable in this uh, dual SVM is is the lambda. And by solving the lambda, you get the dual variable. And get well, after you get the dual variable, you can convert them back to your primal solution. So when you look at this problem, you realize that ah, uh, okay, I have an inner product. So what is the kernel trick here? Well, the kernel trick, if you recall, the kernel trick is really to say that this inner product can be turned into uh, the inner product of uh, 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 phi i and phi uh, j. Okay, so this phi function, it is a nonlinear transformation that you can apply it to the data set, and then you get the inner product in the transformed space. Uh, the kernel trick further says that if you have a nonlinear transform written in this way, then I can find a kernel uh, that, that can be applied to xi and xj. So instead of defining the uh, nonlinear transformation, I can just define, I can just pick a kernel that can execute this inner product operation. Okay. Uh, the, the reason is very simple. To, to get the uh, nonlinear transformation, it could be very difficult. But since ultimately what you care is the inner product, you can just define the kernel right away. So if you have this kernel ready, then what you can do is to replace the inner product by this, uh, 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 this is the kernel. So you have this kernel of xi and xj. You can just replace the, the inner product by this. And you, what you're going to do is to solve this new uh, uh, dual SVM problem, instead of using the inner product, you use the kernel. That will give you a solution of the lambda j, lambda i, lambda j's. That will be the solution for this particular kernel setting. And after you get that uh, lambda i and lambda j, you can go back to the primal problem and then get the primal variable, and then you will get a decision boundary uh, using that kernel. Okay. <clears throat> so, what is the uh, kernel in this case? Well, if I, well, if I choose a, uh, any kernel like this, then the Q matrix, then the Q matrix that I'm going to construct uh, will take this form. Now, you may not remember what this Q matrix is. The Q matrix, it is the matrix that I use to formulate the uh, dual support vector machine problem, uh, where you say that this is max, uh, uh, mass of lambda bigger than zero, and then you have lambda transpose Q lambda plus sum uh, C transpose lambda, subject to the constraint that A lambda is bigger than B. Okay, so this is the dual uh, SVM problem where we need to define this matrix Q, this vector C, this uh, matrix A, this matrix B. The A and B, they're defined by your data sets, data points, and then the C is a linear term, which doesn't really matter to your optimization problem. Uh, it doesn't have this kernel uh, thing here. The only thing that would involve the kernel would be this Q matrix, and this Q matrix, originally, it would be just uh, all these entries. It's an M by M matrix. And now uh, you can plug in uh, all these inner products by the kernels. So now the Q matrix is still the same size, but instead of having the inner product, you just have all the kernels. So let me remind you what are the kernels, where the kernels, they are just uh, 
a, a, a function that takes a pair of inputs xi, xj, that can evaluate this inner product between the two transformations. So, for example, if you have uh, this second order polynomial kernel, uh, then, then this k will be defined as uh, u transpose v uh, with a square. Now, correspondingly, you can find this phi. Okay, it's just a little bit difficult, but you can find the phi. Uh, for the uh, Q, degree Q polynomial, you will have this uh, kind of form. Uh, you can also find uh, the phi function. Uh, the Gaussian radial basis function, RBF kernel, takes this form. Again, you can find a corresponding uh, phi function here that can, that can uh, execute this uh, kernel uh, function. Uh, okay, so, so what is the U, so the question is what is the U and V here? So this is just, uh, um, uh, a shorthand notation for the XI and XJ. So you can read it as, uh, I can just put in, uh, XI and XJ. Then the operation according to this kernel would be, uh, XI transpose XJ a square. So you can dump in, uh, any pair of variables U, U, UV into, into this kernel. Okay, and the U can be XI, V can be XJ. So this is a little bit more general notation than xi j. Okay. So uh, I guess uh, uh, the most powerful thing uh, today to run SVM, this is one of the most useful ones. Okay. So it's the radial basis function. It's defined in in this form. It's basically a Gaussian kernel. Uh, we have seen its uh, usage in um, in the very beginning of our course, and this is the uh, another time we're using the idea. So uh, what do you gain from uh, running a kernel SVM? Now, uh, let's imagine that you have a data set that takes this form. You have the red crosses outside, and then you have the blue circles that are inside. If you just run SVM, the standard SVM, the linear SVM, you will not be able to classify the data uh, because it's inside versus outside. You, you just simply do not have the capability. Now, if you run the, S, if you run the uh, hard SVM, uh, then what you will be able to get will be a, a, a decision boundary like this. Uh, it should be like this. Okay, so this is the uh, solution returned by your um, uh, hard SVM. Uh, so, so you can look at uh, this diagram and you see that what was happening. Well, first of all, you have a margin. Okay, so you have decision boundary and then you also have a margin. The margin is, uh, is here. Okay, so this is your margin, and there's another ring inside. This is your margin, okay? And then you have a set of data points that are living on the margin, and what are they? They are the support vectors. And uh, you, can, you can check that this margin is actually maximized. There is no other form uh, uh, that you can, you, can, you can maximize the margin, okay? And all the data points uh, are inside uh, this circle, they are all the blues, and outside the circle, they are all the reds. Okay, so it's a hard SVM problem, and for this particular case, uh, you can you can already classify them into two classes. Uh, you cannot do it with uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, linear SVM. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, second order kernel. Now, uh, you may ask, what will happen if I have data points, the red crosses? Somehow they go to, they, they, they're living here. What can you do? Then you can run a soft version of the SVM on top of your kernel method. That would be another configuration which I'm not going to go into detail. So, so you can, you can have soft SVM plus kernel trick. That will also work. Uh, if you look at this diagram, you realize that this SVM is, is somewhat really, really powerful. That is, is actually the most robust classifier and that you can, you can get, uh, within the setting of a linear model. Okay. So, so let me, let, let, let me, let me, let me briefly explain this problem here. Um, you, you think about what, 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 the, what is the uh, issue of, um, of misclassification? Uh, okay. So let's say these are the two data points in your space. And suppose you had, you have a hacker. The hacker wants to perturb this image to the other class. This is cat this is dog. Okay. Or the person wants to perturb this data point from the cat to the dog. Uh, and so, uh, it, what, what the person needs to do is to make this data point go across the decision boundary to the other class. Right? So now, imagine that you have a perceptron error from all the hard SVM. The hard SVM says that I, 
I, I just need to maximize the margin, okay? Or as perceptual algorithm says that I just need to have a correct decision boundary. And if that is uh, the case, then what it will find is that uh, this point is very easy to protect to the other class because it's so close to the decision boundary. But if you run SVM, uh, that then uh, for the same set of data points, then this cannot be a good decision boundary. What you need is to have a decision boundary that will be that will be like this. Okay. Now, if you use this decision boundary, what will happen? Well, for both data points that are really, really close to your decision boundary, that margin is, is the biggest already for this problem. You cannot do better, okay? If your perturbation is bigger than this, then of course you will, you, you, you will get a, a misclassification. But the price you, you need to pay um, uh, in this black case versus the red case, of course the red case is a lot harder. The cost that you need to pay is a lot higher. Uh, for, for the hacker to succeed. And in fact, if you look at the recent literature on all these adversary attack, what they're saying is that um, uh, for uh, 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 to, to do the adversarial training, you're trying to m minimize the maximum uh, uh, loss. And effectively, if you go back to the linear case, it's trying to do this SVM problem. And therefore, SVM is, is the most robust classifier in the linear case that even if you uh, 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 even if you solve the adversarial training problem, you're going to get the solution like this. Okay, so let's go in, let's go back to the radio basis function here. This is a diagram that we should have seen before. Uh, if you use the radio basis uh, kernel that it takes this form, uh, then you realize that there's a parameter gamma that you can tune. Uh, if you make the gamma really really um, big, like in this case then uh, your kernel is really, really small, okay? Because you say that these two are my data points and I'm measuring the distance between these two data points. And as long as there, are, there is a small deviation because of the big gamma, I'm going to make a, uh, make a very, very abrupt change to my k. And so uh, anything that is close to my decision boundary will be crosses outside, will, will cross. So, so, so your, your decision boundary will be really, really tight to, your, to one class of the data points. Uh, if you make them really, really small, then it would be the other extreme. Okay, uh, so somewhere in the middle, it would be uh, it would be like this. So that would buy you some additional uh, uh, freedom in handling the nonlinear decision boundaries. So as for what gamma to choose, again, this is a problem uh, of of the designer that you need to run the algorithm multiple times to figure out what is the correct gamma to choose. And therefore, normally when you have a data set, you will chop the data set into two halves. One is called the training set, one is called the validation set. You can use the validation set to do whatever you want, including tuning parameters. Uh, you can never use the test data set to, to tune the parameter. So never try to say, look, uh, uh, I am running into this competition, and then the competition organizer says that this is the, 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 the data set that, that they're going to test me on, and so I'm going to tune my parameter according to that, that, that testing data set, and then I get the best possible uh, values, and then you are very happy, but then two days after they close the competition, and then they say that I'm going to test your algorithm on a new data set, and then you, your method doesn't work. It's because you are just so fine-tuned to uh, the, the testing data set, okay? Uh, and you should not do that, okay? We will talk more about uh, all these uh, subtle issues uh, in part three of our course. But right now, just remember that all these gammas, the Cs, uh, the lambdas, the, all these hyperparameters, we assume that we can tune it uh, using the validation uh, losses. Uh, People have asked me questions before about, okay, if you really use the uh, radio basis function, what is the corresponding nonlinear transform? And it turns out that for this uh, uh, radio basis function, the uh, nonlinear transform tests this extremely interesting form that you don't want to remember that, okay? Uh, now, why is this the case? It's because this is a Gaussian kernel. In order to get to this Gaussian kernel, uh, you, 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 you want to, you want to Factorize this Gaussian kernel into 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 two two halves. So it would be a phi of u and phi of a v. So now, if you want to break it into two, then that means you 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 need to factorize uh, equations in the middle. And now, if I want to write them out, 
uh, you can see that there, there's exponential term of two of uv, and that can only be uh, extracted, that can be only be factorized uh, into in the two by using an infinite series. And that's why the nonlinear transformation of a, a radio basis function takes a very, very complicated form. Okay? Uh, and that also tells you the power of the kernel method, because the kernel method says that even though this, uh, this function is extremely complicated, don't worry. All you need is to know about this k. How do you evaluate this k? You don't need to, you don't, you never need to know how to uh, evaluate this, this uh, phi function. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is the uh, uh, radio basis function. All you need to know is just to evaluate this k. Okay, so is radio basis function always better than a linear decision boundary? Uh, that's also a common question people ask. Uh, I have a, now I, I know how to do kernel tricks. Should I always do kernel trick? The answer is no. Okay. Why should you do kernel trick? You do kernel trick because you need to do kernel trick. You don't have to do kernel trick. This is example. And um, this is the data set that contains crosses and circles. Uh, if I run a soft SVM on this data set, I will be able to get a decision boundary like this. I will have misclassifications, one point here, one point there. It's not perfect, but, but it's pretty reasonable for this data set. Or on the other hand, you can run a Gaussian radio basis kernel by picking an extremely good uh, 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 gamma. That would be the decision boundary. Okay, Which one is better? It's hard to say. It really depends on the underlying testing distribution. But if you ask uh, me, I would say that this is a lot easier. It makes a lot of sense because simpler is better. You, 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 it, there's no reason that you should you should embrace a more complicated uh, classifier when the number of training data points are so few, because you just simply you don't know what will happen in the testing scenario. Uh, so if you choose a, a radio basis function in this case and you don't have too many data points, this can very easily overfit your data point. And this will, will cause a lot of problems when you run the testing situations. So there should be a very uh, careful design that should pair up the model com complexity, meaning that how complicated should your decision boundary be, compared to how many data points that you have. It should not be arbitrary. In the case where you have very, very few data points, I would prefer to choose ex as simple as possible because who knows what will happen in the testing scenario. So the last comment is on uh, how do we test uh, using the kernel trick. Um, so we call that the, um, the support vectors, they're defined as the linear combination of your data points. So now you have this W equal to the submission of all the lambda star. Lambda star will be the solution of your, of your uh, dual problem. So, uh, and then the hypothesis function, uh, which is your final decision boundary, will be written in this form. It will be written as W transpose X plus W zero. So now I can replace my W star by this quantity. And, and you see that if you have this quantity here, you will have X in transpose X coming out here. Okay? Now I'm in the situation of doing kernel trick. And so whenever I see an inner product, I need to replace by a kernel between x in and x. So what is the message? The message is that if you run a kernel SVM, first of all, you solve the dual SVM in the kernel space. Uh, that means your lambda ends, they are coming from the kernel SVM dual problem. That can be solved because once you know the Q, you can solve the uh, problem. After you find a lambda uh, uh, value, then you need to calculate your decision boundary. This decision boundary is uh, determined by um, putting your data point x into this equation, and you check whether this is going to give you plus or minus. Now, how do you do that? You first calculate the kernel with respect to the data points, okay, and then you check. The beauty of SVM is that uh, this lambda n, you only have a few of those that are non-zero. Because it's a support vector machine, so you only need to care about the support vectors. The support vectors, they are returned by the dual problem. Once you have the dual problem, you know who are the support vectors. 
You just need to identify those. It could be two or three data points. And then when you try to run the decision, you just need to calculate the kernel at those support vectors, not every one. Not every one in your data set. The, of course, when you do the training, you need to evaluate every one. It will be pairwise distance between all the training points. Construct that Q matrix. That, that is time consuming. But training is training, okay? Training is offline. You can train for two days. That's no problem, okay? But when you do the uh, testing, you want the testing to be fast. It, here, the testing is really, really fast. Why? You just need to identify a few kernel points. Uh, you just need to identify a few support vectors, run the kernel for those support vectors only, and then you can return me the decision, whether it's positive or negative. That is really, really fast. All right? So uh, the support vector machine, especially the kernel trick, they, they are powerful because, because you, can, you can run a low complexity testing procedure. That is so powerful that uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it's unlike like a deep neural network. You still need to pass through all these neurons and then get a decision. Okay. Here, it will just be immediate. You just need to calculate this kernel and get the decision immediately. Uh, so that concludes the uh, discussion on SVM. So we have gone through all the uh, derivations and also the, um, the important ideas in SVM. Uh, so in homework number four, you will have a chance to implement some of these. Uh, hopefully it's not too hard. Okay, and I really encourage you to sit down and program by yourself, otherwise you will not be able to, to do it. Uh, this is a reading list, same as before. Uh, I still encourage you to read this uh, e-chapter. It's very, very uh, comprehensive on this topic. All right, so let's dismiss.